All right. Hello, good morning, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, it's nice to have you here for our session, uh, Kubel versus Java. Um, so our topic today, um, it's about those two programming languages. Uh, we have Kubel, which is around since uh, 1959. So some may therefore consider it as an ancient language, although a considerable amount of programs on the mainframe is still written in Kubel. Uh, Java, on the other hand, first appeared in 1995. Uh, it's widely used for different kinds of applications and often the first thing that comes to mind when thinking about mainframe modernization. We'd like to discuss uh, today the advantages and uh, disadvantages of each language to find out which of them is the better one, or maybe they're equally capable of getting the job done. Let's find out. So my name is Sabine Deems. Uh, I'm an IBM Z Systems uh, student ambassador captain and also an IBM champion. And with me here hosting the event is Noor. Hello, Noor. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Noor Hawad. I uh, am a rising senior at Rutgers University, Newark, and also the IBM Z Systems student ambassador at my school. At my school and I'm very excited to be here. Um, so to introduce our guests, we have four amazing guest speakers with us today, some of which are also IBM champions. And um, we'll start with, I'm gonna go one by one, you can introduce yourself. So we'll start with Dusty Rivers, who is also an IBM lifetime champion for C Systems. So Dusty, if you can go. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Dusty Rivers. I'm senior director with Mainline Information Systems. And as Noor said, I'm IBM uh, lifetime champion for Z Systems. And I've been I've been on the platform. For, oh, we were we were joking about it. I've been on the platform working for over for, over forty five years. It'll be forty six in June. So awesome. And next we have Wolfram. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for having me. My name is Wolfram Greis. I'm from the European Mainframe Academy, and we educate new mainframers. And I'm also involved a lot of. Uh, uh, education for young people, to, uh, teaching them COBOL, also teaching them Java and other stuff, uh, mainframe architecture and so on from the European Mainframe Academy. Great, and next we have Mark. Hey, I'm Mark. Uh, also, thank you for having me here. I work for the IBM lab in Böblingen as a performance analyst uh, these days, and my specialty is uh, Java on the mainframe. And I'm with the mainframe for uh, roughly 20 years now, and uh, most of the time uh, with Java. Hey, cool. And next we have Herb. Hi there, my name is Herb Daly. I am a uh, senior lecturer at the University of Wolverhampton. I'm also an IBM Z champion, and um, uh, I have an interest in, in all things education, and, and I support like a, a group of um, uh, kind of students who have like a mainframe society uh, where I uh, where I work. Um, I, I guess in a way I'm, I'm maybe the junior of the group. I maybe have about a, a decade or so um, working with uh, with mainframes, uh, but I guess I, I kind of span out onto some other platforms too. So so maybe that balances it out a little bit. Mm. Thank you very much. It's so great having you all here and also our guests. Uh, so we're going to jump right in and ask our first questions. And to the audience, please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat or raise your hand and uh, you can open your mic and ask a question. Uh, we're going to try to answer all of them as much as possible. Um, I'm going to like to start uh, off with Wolfram, please. Um, we, uh, we had once a discussion and um, you told me some things there. So when people hear Java, they probably usually think about Oracle. You explained that that's not correct anymore for Java EE, which is now Jakarta. Can you please explain that? Yes, of course. That's that's uh, that's right. And uh, the the reason is uh, that there is Java around for many years. I think you said before since 1995, and uh, Java has different uh, versions and different specifications. Uh, one of the specifications most people know is the uh, standard edition, and uh, I'm also very often active at universities and other academic institutions. And when I ask the students who knows uh, 
to Java or uh, say, yes, I know Java. I'm going to ask who knows Java Enterprise Edition and the new name is in fact uh, Jakarta. So uh, only a few hands go up. So And, and this is, uh, I think, really important to understand that the Enterprise Edition now renamed to Jakarta is very important when it comes to, to work with Java on mainframes because with the standard edition, you, you have uh, some basic APIs like the uh, Java database connectivity, like RMI and uh, some other APIs. But with uh, Java Enterprise Edition, a lot of more come in with a transaction API, with a, with a persistent API, with Java message services, and so on. So when it comes to work with Java on mainframes, the Enterprise Edition is uh, really important. And now the, uh, the move from Java EE to uh, Jakarta was because Oracle uh, gave up the, uh, the uh, further development of the Enterprise Edition specification and handed it over to the Eclipse Foundation. And because uh, Java, uh, Oracle wanted to keep the, uh, the, uh, the name, uh, the rights of the name Java, uh, the Eclipse organization had to rename this uh, idea and it's now called Jakarta. The, uh, main uh, town of the uh, Java ISIL. And uh, that's, a, that's a reason uh, why it's called now Jakarta. Thank you very much, Wolfram. All right. Um, the second question is for Herbert. So there's this article um, called Is COBOL Holding You Hostage with Math? I'm going to share it in the chat. Um, so about this article it states that developers rewrite COBOL code in Java and Java couldn't get the calculations right. So the question is, can you please briefly explain the reason for that? Sure. So um, as you said, you'll, you'll, you'll post the article and it's, it's, a, it's a really good one by a um, lady called Marianne uh, Bellotti. And uh, it, it really kind of characterizes why languages aren't necessarily interchangeable. Uh, so they, they talk about um, uh, the issues that you get if you are um, moving between fixed point and floating point um, notations. It's all about the, the underlying uh, representation of, of numbers. Now, COBOL was designed for a very specific purpose. Um, it, it was kind of optimized for, um, well, certain certain types for kind of uh, fixed point calculations. So when you're doing, um, you know, kind of multiple iterations, uh, you're, uh, unless you have um, a, a kind of a consistent scheme for representing numbers, over time, you will be losing your, your accuracy. And uh, I mean, there, there are people that, that kind of do experiments on numbering schemes, as, as all computer science students will know, um, you know, kind of numbers are a little bit of a fallacy, right? We, we've just come up with this idea about how we represent things. And depending on the representation you use, uh, you may end up with different results or different levels of accuracy. The, what, what we're telling you in the, in the article there is, unless you bear this in mind when you're making your conversions and i encourage you to have a go at this uh, you know muck around with um, i mean python's quite an easy one but um uh, java kind of similarly depending on the types you use um uh you know as you as you start to 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 kind of iterate the errors will will effectively uh, kind of kind of grow it's not that COBOL's particularly better. It's just that it is very well understood and the types are optimized for uh, fixed point calculations. So the notion that you could literally just translate from one language into another <clears throat> is, is a little bit um, misleading. Um, I'm sure we'll get into the conversation because there are various types that you could use in Java or you could actually implement fixed point yourself if you wanted to, and people have done that. But I, I think at, at this level, it's it's just just the note that we think that you could replace one language with another, but it might not be quite that simple. Yeah, you know, sure, you know, underneath, you know, it's all Turing machines, but 
based on on kind of how they work and subtle differences in in representation we can end up with fundamentally different results that so is help. scary to hear <laughs> but thank you for the explanation i mean so if you just translate you think you have your math right and then suddenly you start losing uh, <laughs> some mm -hmm. some money somewhere uh, that can be really an issue yeah, well, in, in the article, it talks about how, you know, uh, ro rockets have gone off course and things have blown up for the sake of um, poor precision. I, I, I recommend having a good read of that article. It, yeah. it really does um, get into Very the details. Thank you. Uh, so, Mark, considering what Herbert now explained, how can any COBOL program be rewritten in Java? So, uh, like Herb mentioned, maybe to to uh, make the... Uh, the um, conversion of the numbers yourself? Or is there any other way maybe that you can think of that the issue can be addressed and mitigated? Yeah, sure. So I apologize for not having read uh, the article <laughs> that I pointed to. But uh, <clears throat> I mean, very probably this this uh, is related to um, fixed point decimal versus uh, floating points yeah, and rounding errors and uh, all those kinds of things. And of course, uh, you can you can have the same uh, precision in uh, Java with uh, classes like big decimal, and so on and so forth. And uh, in on on our dear IBM mainframe, we even have uh, acceleration for that. Yeah? Meaning, while on other platforms you have uh, the functionality uh, on the mainframe, we even have acceleration for um, conversion between peg decimal and stuff like that. So definitely, you can uh, convert. Uh, those uh, COBOL math calculations to Java. <laughs> it's just uh, a matter of uh, knowing the Java API, I, I would say. Yeah, but uh, that is just one aspect uh, of uh, converting from COBOL to Java because um, yeah, what I have seen at customers is uh, that they're using uh, automated conversion. And uh, I have a colleague of mine and uh, he he always calls this Joe Ball, <laughs> yeah. so so it's not it's not really Java, but it's it's not Cobol either. So it's a Joe Ball, uh, so something in between. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's more or less uh, unmaintainable code. Yeah? So if you really want to rewrite uh, from Cobol to Java, then and then you have to have um, an application programmer who is really familiar with Java and understands what's going on inside of the COBOL program and then writes a real Java application, yeah? meaning uh, utilizing all of the nice things that Java has, and not trying to translate one-to-one uh, -one from COBOL to Java. That's, that's probably one of the biggest errors that, uh, that or mistakes that people uh, make when, when they try to do conversions. I'm glad you used the word Joe Ball, and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so also one of the things I was thinking as both of you were talking is I know on the uh, on the Z Systems platform, there's a lot of optimization for a lot of that numeric. And I was actually talking to a colleague right. yesterday <clears throat> about the uh, I think I think the the official name for it is automatic was automatic binary optimization is you know obviously the fear of most COBOL developers is okay I've got this program running it's running great but I buy new hardware and it doesn't run as well or I buy a new hardware and it doesn't run as well but they don't want to compile it for a couple of reasons one uh, they may not know where the current source code is and two they may be afraid to do it because it may not work as well. And so uh, as they go from like, uh, you know, the Z13 to the Z14 to the Z15, Z16, a lot of the hardware has been uh, accelerated for performance <coughs> and the new compilers are taking advantage of that. So if you don't recompile your code, and I know the current version of COBOL, I think it's 6.4, it, it takes advantage of that, but there may be some things that don't work quite well. And I know with ABO, or the binary optimization, you can actually run the load module through optimization and it will make those changes uh, kind of, they said magic, but it, it looks like magic, but basically you can allow that program without being compiled to take advantage of the new hardware accelerators. And a lot of the things I think Herb that they were talking about was the math issues that you were talking about actually mm -hmm. speeding up the execution through, uh, through microcode or through uh, attached hardware. 
sure. Uh, may, maybe at this point I'd, I'd say, um, just to explain the background to this, that the conversation was around whether it's better maybe to, to know COBOL or to know Java or, or kind of the relative advantages of the two. And I, I kind of come at this from two directions. The first thing on my mind <laughs> is that uh, COBOL on the platform is a thing, is totally a thing. So even if you are creating you know, kind of programs in Java, unless you can read COBOL quite well, there are a lot of resources or, or a lot of the, the kind of the source that's sitting on the platform won't be available to you to read and understand. Yeah? Mm. I, I kind of think of it almost like, um, you know, we, we've had discussions where I say, well, look, Co COBOL, it's like a coral reef, right? There, there's a lot of it and it's there. It is its own ecosystem. And so you, th th there are things that you need to learn to kind of understand, you know, what's, what, what, what's really there. So that, that, that's one end. On the other end, um, creating, so, so porting um, kind of functionality from one language to another isn't just about uh, the, um, uh, the, the, you know, ne necessarily kind of some of the underneath and nitty gritty. Uh, code is an artifact. And over time, this code that you're looking at will have picked up all sorts of business logic. It will have been run, it will have been tested, and you, you could say it's quite mature. And so there's a lot to be said for learning to riff off the benefits of mature code and understanding the ecosystem that you're, that you're stepping into. Right. So this, I mean, there's one very important point that you made, Herb, and uh, this is that uh, a lot of this COBOL code uh, has been owned over the years, you know. <laughs> Probably it didn't start uh, um, to its full glory right from the start, yeah, but uh, maybe it was also running bumpy, but people had years and years and years to make it better, to, to optimize it and things like that. And uh, with Java code, this is uh, unfortunately, <laughs> in many cases, not the case. Yeah, So you have a Java application that is brand new, uh, maybe it was developed in a hurry, and it uh, comes into production and <laughs> things happen, yeah? So it's not performing as expected uh, and things like that. And, and um, at least my experience is it also boils down to um, the amount of experience that uh, the very developer has who, who implements um, business logic, yeah? So if you have, if you have somebody um, that has just uh, a couple of months or years of experience. That's that's a difference um, uh, compared to somebody who has you know decades of experience in in the industry, obviously. And this is another aspect uh, that that many people don't keep in mind when they compare uh, Java and Cobol. You know. And I, and I think adding on to that, if I can, is you know Cobol Cobol is procedural and it's it talks about simple human like context, but if I write a sentence and then I give that to her, he may read that sentence in a different way based on his background and what he's doing. So the co and I, I always say this is if you write co if you write a COBOL program and you compile it and you put it in production and you walk away from it and then you have to go back in six months to make a change, you really have to reacclimate yourself. So it's not even code that you wrote yourself is kind of, I don't want to say it's difficult, but you kind of have to reacclimate, and you forget why did I do that? And and we all know I don't I don't want to mm. anyone to uh, spit coffee on their keyboard, but we mm. all know that every Java programmer and every COBOL programmer documents their code great. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No yeah. matter which program, we are all no. documenting everything very well. <laughs> <laughs> At least we should. <laughs> well, we, we sometimes hear the phrase, if it was hard to write, then it should be hard to read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, in fact yeah. when we were talking about decades, is we, I was working at a, uh, working to, to uh, create an API for a COBOL program years ago. And someone said, why is the program doing this? And so someone looked at the code and surprisingly, this routine was added to the program. It had been running in production. It had never changed. 
since 1977. Mm. And mm. it was like, oh, we put this in there for this. And it's like, luckily, the programmer put it in there and said that programmer was no longer with us. But his comment was, hey, I added this to the code because of this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, and th this is this is where my my, my academicness kind of comes out. I'll I'll post you a link um, to a to a book, um, uh, but um, you know, <laughs> source, source code is an artifact. Um, source, source code is a thing that you know multiple hands have kind of worked on over time. Um, you know, kind of influences how you should use it and appreciate it and the fact that you will find these strange things in there or that there will be you know kind of design decisions that were that were made often because of the architecture that has since mm -hmm. changed or is no longer an issue <laughs> but it's still reflected in the code because at the time that was kind of the best way to do it um it, it's worth it's worth mm -hmm. kind of factoring that in when you are kind of creating uh, you, you know, kind of um, when you're surveying or, or, or kind of creating functionality. I mean, I think one of the things that Java and COBOL have in common is that a lot of people think they're both horrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, a, lot, a lot of people talk about them like they're very ugly babies, uh, which, which is a bit unfair. Uh, but but often what, what what's kind of going on there is that there was a lot of COBOL written in kind of the the kind of early phase of, of kind of programming and it, so it was in very much uh, like a, a lingua franca you know kind of a lot of a lot of COBOL was written by a lot of people who weren't hugely experienced with programming at one stage mm -hmm. and Java being you know 95 I remember a lot of universities kind of picked it up so it was often kind of the first language that people learned and and so it was kind of like the generic language that anybody could have a go at. So often people who are writing both languages maybe weren't at the apex of their software engineering skills when they wrote that code. You know, maybe that was where they were kind of cutting their their teeth. And, and so, so that, that's definitely had an impact both on their reputation and on the quality of the code that you sometimes, you know, kind of run into if you're, if you're just kind of picking around the repository. Yeah. Yep. Do, do you know the, uh, the quote from uh, Edgar Dijkstra from 1975? <laughs> I, I, I do. Yeah, I just copied it in the uh, chat for, for everyone to see it. Uh, he quoted in 1975 that the use of COBOL cripples the mind. Its teaching should therefore be regarded as a criminal <laughs> offense. <laughs> But, yeah, really, really important in my opinion is it was 1975 and only in 1985, 1985 COBOL, the structured programming came in place with uh, local variables and with perform statements and so on. So there are Uh, a lot of things changed since then. I think in 1975, it, it was uh, uh, maybe a correct quote, but afterwards, especially today, it's uh, not uh, anymore uh, yeah, reasonable to, to talk about it or, to, yeah, or to, was, to quote it. There was a comment in the chat when someone mentioned that when they started writing COBOL, they had to, their, their particular company or practice used a... Uh, Uh, a programming technique called JSP or Jackson's uh, structured programming. Ooh, yeah. There's also another. That. There's other school, the Jordan structured programming, where it's mm -hmm. kind of like, yeah. okay, if you use if you use a go to, you you get thrown out of the company. And yeah. you know, in in you know, back to Herb's point is when people started, they used Java. But when when I when I started, there was you use COBOL, but you had like code reviews, and you had the Jordan. You had you had to conform, conform to coding techniques. So we're going to design our code this way. And so kind of also back to Mark's point, a lot of the code has been around for a long time. And if you look at a piece of code, it may have been designed based on one technique. And then I took it over and I didn't want to use that. So I just did it another way. And then Herb took that same code over and did it a different way. So you have different uh, dialects in the code uh, over the years that have been. And you kind of have to look at the uh, paid use word legacy. You kind of have to look at the word of the legacy of the person that, you know, uh, preceded you and what their what their frame of reference was because uh as as wolfram said uh some programmers love to use perform 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 and you get nine levels deep and you don't know where you came from so mm -hmm. yeah 
And there was this other question in the chat uh, that asked uh, whether Java or COBOL would be better uh, due to their, um, you know, approach like procedural versus object oriented. And uh, I mean, I would say the answer to that question is is also uh, it, it depends on how how well uh, the architecture of the application is done. Yeah, so you can write not so nice uh, code in, in COBOL and you can write not so nice uh, code in Java. Yeah, and Java yeah. tries yeah. to help you to organize this in, in a in a kind of an, uh, a better and uh, and more organized way. But uh, believe me, I have seen many Java applications over the years. And uh, it's it's not, you know, by nature that only because you have uh, this object-oriented approach, the applications uh, look better. Uh, it 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 really depends on um, both the design of an architecture, uh, sorry, the design of an application, and also the skills of uh, the developers. Yeah. And I think I think another important remark at this point is that uh, COBOL is not a, a general uh, language. Uh, COBOL is for business applications. <coughs> you don't right. uh, uh, program any graphical interfaces with COBOL or something like this, where mm -hmm. object-oriented programming is uh, more feasible than, than uh, when you write COBOL programs. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I think, an, an important uh, difference. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But... In, in my experience, I mean, since since uh, since I mostly deal with um, enterprise customers, um, I haven't seen a lot of uh, graphical Java applications over the years. Uh, you know, you know, desktop type of applications, maybe, maybe um, uh, web applications, of course. Yeah, but um, yeah, mm. object orientation is is also used for for business uh, type of applications, not, yep. not just for GUIs. Yeah. I, guess. I want to yeah, bring up. An... I want to bring Sorry. up another point, which is, uh, I think, uh, important to, to note when it comes to this uh, question of uh, COBOL and, uh, and uh, Java, it's mainframe modernization, because many uh, shops today, mainframe shops want to modernize their application environment. And there's mm -hmm. also a remark in the, uh, in the chat uh, that we need younger people to, to modernize applications and so on. And the, I think the main thing is uh, that you don't find too much COBOL programmers when you want to, to modernize your applications, but you find a lot of uh, Java programmers, not uh, necessarily Java Enterprise <laughs> Edition, but uh, Java. And uh, I think uh, the idea to modernize uh, application environment is really important. And then you also think about uh, migrating your COBOL application to another <laughs> programming language. And in my opinion, then the uh, other programming language could be Java and in most cases will be Java. Yeah. And there are, there are okay. some reasons for it. Ha, ha, hang on then. But before we go there, so <laughs> you, you, you've thrown in your Dijkstra quote. Okay. I didn't know you'd go there so soon. And, and I know that one quite well. Perhaps you aren't so familiar with uh, his letter to the uh, educational board of the uh, University of Austin, where he denounces Java and it's... Um, its role in uh, undergraduate education uh, as, a, as a first language. I, I stuck that quote in there because it's um, it, it's funny. There's a little poem that kind of mentions the fact that you didn't like either of them. Um, when it comes to user interfaces, very often that's not what you're using your mainframe for. And there are other yeah. languages. It's kind of how you'd interact with other languages. So so you you you, you it's kind of horses for courses. You wouldn't be trying to write a a, um, a user interface in, in in COBOL, and as I was saying, COBOL's there. there, there there's over a billion lines of it. Mm. Hundreds of millions of lines are, are written every year, and that's according to the Open Mainframe Project. So, in a way, you do have to understand and appreciate it to an extent. Mm. Even if what you're saying is you go with the convenient languages that people know for mainframe modernization. And I mean, my interest is in modernization as well. Then maybe it's not that you want to go with the languages that people know, because then you kind of get this thing where you, it, 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 it's the, the kind of the, the Joe Bowl kind, kind of thing where you, you kind of want to think more about, well, what functionality are you migrating and why? So there, there's there's always there's always a bit more to it. Just picking the languages that people already know 
isn't necessarily a, a good way to get the type of modernization that you're you're, you're thinking of yeah. and that could well be one of the reasons why so many modernization projects fail terribly mm -hmm. yeah right yeah right um, Herb, uh, you mentioned there are billions of lines of COBOL. There is a question in the LinkedIn chat uh, asking, what is the future lifespan of COBOL? Uh, what do you guys think uh, what that would be, since there are so many lines of COBOL calls still around? Well, um, so um, <laughs> there, there, there's, a, there's a term that came up the other day when I was talking to a friend, uh, you know, just kind of reflecting on some of these these things. Uh, the, the term was intergenerational computing. Mm -hmm. So computing as a as a as a thing, uh, you know, we're looking late late fifties, right? And the earliest people who who started developing, you know, kind of software artifacts, things have changed kind of underneath them. But there are still things floating about. Um, things that are they're kind of too too big to kind of you know just just take your hands off of that we are actually learning how to hand over and in many ways this is the first generation where we have to say look this is something that will be passed down in the same way if you look at these great cathedrals mm -hmm. that you know took hundreds of years to build and the craftsmen that started them knew that they would have to be passed on they weren't going to complete them themselves it feels like what's going on at the moment, we could never big bang away all the COBOL that we have. And we as a community are going to have to learn how to do this intergenerational piece mm -hmm. to pass mm -hmm. on our technology and our artifacts. And to be honest, and I, I think this is something people easily forget, we are not the only ones. Every platform has what you would call legacy. Um, the process by which something becomes legacy is not as straightforward as people might intuitively think. I mean, some of it is just, you know, you know, some of it's going backwards, some of it's going forward, some of it's going sideways. And something that we will have to learn the way that, you know, kind of great, great craftsmen of old learned to hand things over and have intergenerational um, artifacts and, and, and crafts we are the first platform who are understanding what it means to have intergenerational computing so my gut feel is this is something that isn't going away anytime soon and it's something we're gonna have to learn to manage effectively yeah totally agree and uh, this is also one reason that uh, we, we uh often recommend in many cases that the migration from uh, COBOL to Java is the right idea because you can stay on the platform. Uh, what you just uh, talked about, uh, make a big bang and go to another platform, there is much more risk in it as if you change uh, certain, not all, but certain applications from COBOL to Java and stay on the mainframe. I'm involved in a project in Germany where I do exactly just these things. It, it's called uh, project optimizing uh, mainframe and uh, the migration is uh, wherever it is useful to migrate from COBOL to Java, but stay on the mainframe because the performance on the mainframe, I think this is uh, now Mark's term, is uh, uh, for, for Java is really, really good. And we also did some uh, migrations from COBOL to Java. And uh, we were really astonished that most of the uh, applications run much faster than before. And maybe it's a good idea, Mark, for you to join in and, and uh, <laughs> discuss the performance yeah. aspect. So, I mean, as I said in the beginning, I have seen a number of uh, conversion projects where uh, that exactly was not the case, Wolfram. So <laughs> they converted from uh, COBOL to, to Java and uh, the initial performance experience was like a 10x um, loss in performance. Yeah? But this was mostly due to the uh, bad quality of the generated code. Mm. Um, and um, I mean, we in, in some of those um, uh, occasions, we were able to improve this uh, to, to something like uh, a one to two, but still in, in the favor of COBOL. Yeah? But as I said, I, I mean, this is, this is very probably still uh, due to the fact that we were using um, a generator for the code. It, it mm. was not real yeah. Java code. It was just uh, trying to, to mimic. 
<laughs> exactly to hope on whatever was uh, yeah. uh, whatever the cobalt code was doing no but um, I I'm I mean whenever I hear the term modernization um, uh, I I would ask uh, why yeah why why are you trying to to modernize is it uh, is it just that you want to convert from COBOL to Java? <laughs> I think that's probably not uh, the, the best uh, um, starting point for such a journey. Yeah? So I, most of the migrations that were successful um, that I have seen are, are done in a way that you do a kind of a stepwise uh, modernization. Yeah, Let's, yeah. for example, um, say you have, I don't know, a thousand uh, COBOL, um, a thousand kicks transactions written in COBOL. Yeah? And uh, you start by maybe moving one of it uh, to Java and, and just, then just uh, you know, gather experience with uh, what you did. And if it works okay, then you can start converting another one, but not just for the sake of uh, conversion, but only in, in case um, you have, I don't know, for example, lost the source code or you want to do, um, um, a big change to the application and, and stuff like that, then, then it makes sense uh, to modernize. You know, mm. Or if you want to add new parts mm. to, to an application. But I think uh, the, uh, the approach just for the sake of uh, con converting is, is not a good idea for, yeah. for yeah. an entire yeah. modernization project. Yeah. Or if you're, keeping, if you're keeping score, I'm going to agree with Mark. Uh, <laughs> that <laughs> if you're, uh, the question is why? I deal, you know, I deal with mainframe modernization, and there's like 12 or 13 different definitions. It's not just one. And I think the important question is, why are you modernizing? Why are you making this change? Why are you, why are you changing anything? And I think the, to also the question in most cases is someone came, comes in and says, we're just going to change everything. And the question is, why? You know, why are you changing it? Why are you updating it? Why are you modernizing? What are you going to do? And in some cases, as Mark said, if you've got a thousand transactions, maybe you, maybe you turn a transaction into an API and it's COBOL and it works great. Then maybe you can take that transaction in COBOL, rewrite it in Java, leave the API the same and you can change the back end if that makes sense. But then you kind of have to look at why you're doing it. And I guess, you know, I, I forgot who asked the question about how long is COBOL going to be around? I pulled some numbers because Herb was, when, when Herb was chatting, it says right now, uh, well, it, I think there's 220 billion lines of COBOL, but it says that COBOL handles 95% of all ATM card swipes. Mm. It handles 80% of all in-person credit card transactions. Now, if you think about it, when you go into the store or you go to the web and you use your credit card or you use whatever, that application on the web is not COBOL. <clears throat> that user interface is not COBOL. Those yeah. devices, those point of sale devices are not COBOL, but when it hits the machine in the back to do the fraud detection, to do the credit card lookup, to do the balance, that's COBOL. So, you know, when you say, I want to modernize it, there are ways to modernize and you kind of have to step back at some point and say, I know, I hear this all the time. Well, we're going to modernize our systems. And my use question is, how do you define modernizing your systems? And mm -hmm. I usually get a very puzzled look like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, modernization means a lot of things to a lot of people. Tell me right. how you define that. In, in my opinion, there are, there are three main reasons uh, based on a lot of discussions with customers. Uh, it's to get more independent uh, because uh, with Java, uh, you can go to other platforms if you want. Uh, this is, uh, I think, one of the uh, very important reasons. The next is you don't get uh, too much new talents knowing COBOL. You get easier uh, new talents knowing Java. And the you last might one, have to train them. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but the, the last reason is also cost optimization at many, mm. uh, many customer shops because Java code is running on the CPs. That's uh, the, 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 the uh, um, uh, basic processors and it's I think it's not important for universities and so on but it's important for the customer sites and all the Java code <clears> all <throat> that is running in a JVM is running on the SIPs and the SIPs uh, doesn't impact the software license fees uh, of all the other um, mm. uh, products that are running in the COS environment so the cost aspect in my opinion is one of the most important reason why uh, customers want to migrate their, their um, environment, their, their landscape. 
Okay, we, we, we'll come back to that one. I would say there's an issue about long-term costs and short-term costs, but that, that, that's another thing. At this point, I would put another book on the table. Uh, this is a modern mainframe development. Um, I think you'll, you'll all like a look at that. And it's a great introduction to the modern tools that you have that you can use when working with a mainframe and talks about, you know, kind of the classic environment, you know, with kind of uh, kicks and, and you know, all those all those kinds of things. Re recommend a, a good look at that. It doesn't talk much about Java, but it does talk about um, kind of COBOL because it, it's something yeah, that you'll yeah. that you'll meet. Now, when Wolfram, you say that actually it's a very good way to keep people on the platform. Uh, I mean, I completely agree there that actually there are a lot of good reasons why people would want to stay on this platform. And the way I typically explain it is it's like, OK, you have cars now, which are, you know, kind of very modern and convenient, but trains are still the most efficient way to get freight from one city to another or people or, or, or whatever. You know, uh, mainframes have been doing this large scale processing uh, and the, the the kind of the lessons they've learnt, uh, you know, kind of the, the things that they're able to bring to the party. If you are, if you are processing data about, you know, above a certain volume, mainframes are definitely going to be the best way to, to do that. And there's all kinds of things that people are saying about, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, move it, move it to the cloud. I mean, to, today's, to, if, if you look at those cloud languages, you know, AWS, you kind of go, well, so what's to say that that's always going to be supported? What's to say that that's not going to be legacy in five years, 10 years, 15 years? There, there are things on the mainframe that have literally been running for 50 years. How many companies right now, you want to move it to another platform, who's going to promise you that that stuff's going to be running for 50 years? That, mm. that's, that's a whole different level of commitment. And I think people who were, you know, if, if, that's, if, if it's the language that's worrying you, that's, that's, you know, not keeping you on the platform, maybe you don't quite understand what your business is for and how it works because that what you're gaining from having a, a system that works on the kind of scale and with the kind of um, availability and reliability that mainframe does is something quite different to what you would say with the language it's that sometimes you have conversations with people and it's like okay you have like a 20 million dollar painting and you want to hang it with five cents worth of string right um that, that, that doesn't you know in terms of long-term and short-term thinking that that doesn't make a a whole lot of sense um one of the things i've been quite interested in is modernization in terms of culture so in terms of ways of thinking in terms of ways of developing in terms of openness to, to kind of new technologies one of the aspects that you get with enterprise systems is that <laughs> often it's it's kind of once you've written it it's going to be in place for a long time and it's going to be doing a heck of a lot of transactions and so there's a lot that you don't learn so much about creating new systems it's like kind of building a ship you kind of you build it once and that could last for a very long time so the ideas about how you build new stuff or how you create new stuff do they need refreshing every every now and again and one of the things um that i think would be interesting to kind of hear about is how we bring some of these other technologies you know not just java into play on on the platform um i, I know we're going to talk a little bit about uh, performance and i think uh, the jvm and the issues about compilation kind of come in but that also does open up other opportunities that I think kind of go beyond a COBOL Java kind of binary way of thinking about what we what we do next. And I think I'll 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 try to find the link. I've got the I've actually got the copy. There was a brand new red book put out, uh, IBM Red Book on application modernization, uh, and it talks about hybrid cloud languages and things like that. So it's a great. Yeah, it's a free red book. I'll drop the uh, uh, the link to that. It just came out a couple of weeks ago. So, and uh, also when you're talking about metrics or economics, or there was a recent study that was commissioned that 
when you're talking about modernization and you were going to cloud first, everything goes to the cloud. They're now actually they're actually publishing numbers that you may actually have. 10x or 5x, it costs more to go there than it did if you had left it on the mainframe. And that was published. I've got the link for that also. Those are, those are available. Is you know, now that there's metrics coming out, as, uh, as Wolfram said, if you're modernizing on the platform, you know, uh, you know I, I said this yesterday, and I, I was at a Z Council, you know, the Z16 is the most modern platform on the planet right now. And yeah. it is the mainframe. It is, it is uh, and what's running there uh, is, is secure, it's future proofs and everything else. And I was looking at one of the statements here and it said, as you just said, is, you know, their statement is modernization means a lot of things. And I think you have to clarify that. So I'll let you, I'll let you go back to uh, some of the other stuff because we, we kind of took the call over from, <laughs> I didn't know if Sabina or Noor, if you had more questions. Well, there are a couple of questions in the chat, but it was it was so interesting to listen to you guys. I mean, this discussion is really interesting. <laughs> uh, but maybe Nua had uh, one question from the chat regarding performance. Maybe that would be interesting to discuss as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, yeah. So the it was from LinkedIn. So this question is: How well is the performance of object-oriented programming like Java compared to COBOL? Yeah, so if if uh, the rest of the gang is okay, <laughs> I'm going to answer sure. this one. So my take is always if um, if the application is is written uh, by somebody who who knows uh, what he does, yeah, and <laughs> then the performance will be almost exactly the same uh, comparing from Cobalt to Java. But as I said, if you put a newbie uh, Cobalt programmer. Um, uh, uh, on, on the desk and, and say, look, implement this, and you have a very experienced Java uh, programmer, then very probably the Java application will run faster and vice versa. Yeah? So it's not a question of, uh, of the language, but really of the experience of, uh, of the people. Yeah? And uh, I mean, in the old days of Java on the mainframe, yeah, we had the issue that the JVM uh, did not perform as well as we uh, hoped it would, but uh, this this has changed over uh, this has changed dramatically over over the last uh, decades. Yeah, IBM invested a lot of um, effort and uh, people into optimizing Java on the platform. So nowadays, um, Java is running. I would say uh, the mainframe is actually the best platform to to run Java applications on. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, no, no, that, that that sounds pretty that sounds pretty fair. Uh, I mean, it's not the only language that runs on the JVM. Uh, there, there, <laughs> right. are, there are many many different ones, and and depending on what you're doing, that 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 might be uh, worth uh, worth exploring. Uh, I mean, it, it's j jumping back to uh, to what Wolfram was saying, um, but before about um, yeah, you can run these on the um, on the zips. Is it zips or zaps these days? They got rid of the zaps, didn't they? We're, we're, we're zips only. No, no, zaps yeah. are no longer available. It's, it's, yeah. it's the zips now. It's the zips these yeah. days. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad I can be out of date on something mainframe. Uh, that, that makes me feel like, you know, <laughs> part, 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 of the, part of the team. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, and, and that that's why there's certain types of things that it 1,000% makes sense to do in in Java. Uh, I mean, I think things like Kix Explorer is, is you know developed in 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 Java. Um, you know, so 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 for certain for certain kinds of things, for certain kinds of jobs, it's like yeah, that that would be your go-to language. Uh, I mean, you, you say it probably runs better on the mainframe than any other platform. Yeah, and people on other platforms would say just generally it doesn't run very well, and they have other languages that they would kind of use. So it, it's, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's kind of kind of horses for courses. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, if it if it is a way to get people in, and once they're in, they can start to learn about the whole ecosystem, and they can do other other kinds of things. I mean, some of the stuff that they're doing on cryptography. And I know that's all written in Java at IBM. I mean, that is, you know, top of the line stuff. That That is, you know, le leading edge. There's no platform that has anything that can that can touch that. And so to know about those things, it would do you well to, to know the Java and be, and be kind of making use of it. But again, there's so much COBOL there. 
it's um uh, there was another thing i was another idea i was going to bring up there, there's conversations in in the software development community about what they call rather than software engineers menders so there, there are people that like you know kind of making new code there are people that like you know kind of um i don't know improving code and there are people that like kind of taking artifacts looking at them figuring out how they work and how to make them better and they talk about software men menders and there's a whole conference for this mendercon it's a guy called m scott ford a really good guy and um there there is something of the mender mindset that really makes sense if you're working with a mainframe environment walking into a shop meeting it where it is and then figuring out how to how to improve how to make things better how to support how to fix uh you know pr probably exactly what you're doing mark with the with the tuning and the performance and the optimization you know not going in and saying right we want to start everything from scratch <laughs> that mindset where we say okay i know what we're working with and this is how we're going to move it to a place where we'd like it to be exactly. and th th there's a whole conversation about that over and above any language mm. how you engage with the platform how you engage with the artifacts and how you make mm. them do what you actually need them to do right and qu quickly coming back to this uh, whole modernization discussion i would say um use use the best tool for the job yeah and uh, COBOL definitely is very well suited if you have to move masses of data from left to right <laughs> that's that's what it was built for so I, I see little value of replicating this uh, with a with a Java application because jo COBOL already does the job extremely well. Yeah? But uh, if you, for example, have um, something, and I know that uh, a couple of uh, customers in the banking space do this, if you if you have a, a list of let's say um, bank transfers or, or whatever, and you want to to zip it and send it somewhere off, you could implement uh, the zip algorithm in COBOL. <laughs> But uh, I think the better way to do this uh, would be Java because everything is already there. Yeah. So extract the data uh, with COBOL, put it to some place, zip it with uh, Java, and send it off to to your uh, communication partner. Uh, that, the, that's the, just uh, one one example. Yeah. So use the best tool for for the job. But the, the problem is uh, the, the challenge you can't uh, solve with uh, with the uh, COBOL. Uh, um, <clears throat> idea is uh, that you are uh, still platform dependent and with Java you you are platform independent and uh, mm -hmm. I think this is a uh, in my opinion this is one of the, the, the many many reasons the, the customers want to to switch to to Java because afterwards they are platform more platform independent than with COBOL I think that's that's a fact or not now yeah. yeah. when you say platform independent are you referring to the um, the original Java 1995 mythology of you know write, write it once and then you could just move it to any platform? Yes, and and I think it's it's uh, it's true, but of course if you use special uh, uh, APIs that are only available on the mainframe, then you are still platform dependent. That is right, but on the uh, the concept, uh, I think still is true that with Java write once run anywhere. It can be an issue. So, I mean, I, I've been knocking around with it since it came out. I have mates that were working on Java when it was still Oak. Uh, the Java I wrote back then wouldn't run in Java now. <laughs> uh, the, the, I mean, I remember before it split into um, um, uh, it, its different editions, uh, I, I did a bit of coding in J2ME, the, the mobile version, which isn't really Java at all. No, no, um, <laughs> Uh, the, the, these these things, <laughs> you, you know, it, it, it's in in other software engineering communities. The notion that that Java is is kind of portable. Pe people often talk about it as it's it's dangerously unportable. So it, it looks like you've ported it, but then the differences in implementation. Uh, and this is like within the virtual machine, and that depends on who made the virtual machine for the platform and and yeah. and whatever. Means that it's very hard to spot errors. The errors go, you know, much deeper. It's a similar thing that you have with with Python, where 
it's really easy to get something to run, but debugging it is the biggest pain in the world. And that that notion that, you know, oh yeah, 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 I'll just I'll just recompile it for this other platform and I'll move it wholesale. Yeah, sure, if it's something not hugely important that will rinse the world, if it, if it well, won't rinse the world if it goes wrong, a lot of the things that we're talking about, the reason that they're on a mainframe in the first place is that they are one way or another mission critical. And so the notion that you could kind of move it around willy nilly yeah you know i i i i know a lot of people who would definitely question that yeah so i mean uh, maybe maybe the moving around of the application because of the uh, independence of the underlying hardware that's uh, that is a true aspect but you can't easily move applications around uh, because of all of the the qualities of service that the platform has yeah Mm -hmm. Uh, the security the reliability you can't move those (laughs) <laughs> one to one from the mainframe yeah. to any other yeah. platform, and that's yeah. that's the, the challenge uh, behind yeah. this. IO, what he's doing with IO around the back. Yeah, and and what he didn't discuss up to now is uh, also the idea of uh, um, <clears throat> supporting uh, huge transaction. Uh, um, volumes, yeah, yeah. Uh, possibility with this because with Sysplex, parallel Sysplex, and GDPS, uh, you you scale very good on the uh, on the mainframe, and I think there is no other platform that uh, scale so well if it comes to uh, huge uh, transaction rates. As example, I al- uh, always ask uh, other people, where are the biggest uh, big ba- uh, uh, banks in the world? The four biggest banks are in China. And all these banks in China uh, use IBM mainframes because they have Sysplex, parallel Sysplex, and GDPS. And otherwise, they wouldn't get these transaction rates. And they don't use these mainframes because they're like IBM or they want to have uh, machines from the United States. Uh, it's because they have no other no other choice. The uh, biggest bank in uh, in China, the Industrial Commercial Bank of China, does 1.5 billion transactions a day, and they can't do it with any other platform. That's another issue I think with that is also important. If you program the the, the applications in Java or Cobalt, doesn't matter, but you have to <laughs> you have to have these qualities. What uh, Mark just did. I, I really hate to stop the discussion here because it's really interesting and we have a lot of interesting <laughs> comments in the chat as well, uh, which I will uh, will share on the student hub later on so uh, everybody can, can enjoy them and comment on them. Um, but I'm going to, uh, for the closing, I'm going to share a whiteboard with some links. Um, so uh, whoever wants to uh, look at those um, has it in the recording as well. And uh, then I'm going to ask uh, every one of you for some closing words, uh, maybe starting with Dusty. So just uh, briefly here, uh, we have the link for the IBM C Explorer. So um, if some of you, maybe some students, some other people have not uh, got some hands-on experience with what we've talked about, um, you can try out the IBM C Explorer here. Uh, feel free to use the ambassador referral link and. Uh, either choose Noor's or my name there if you want to. You can try out on an actual mainframe, uh, COBOL, Java, many other things. Uh, Here is also the link to the Global Student Hub uh, where we're gonna put a thread with a discussion and with a recording later on. And uh, the link to uh, the article we talked about, uh, the automatic binary optimizer that Dusty mentioned, and also a link to Java EE Jakarta. Um, so, uh, Dusty, can you please uh, start with some closing notions um, about our discussion today? Yeah, I think I think it, in the end, from my opinion, you know, COBOL is the language of business for most large institutions, uh, and it's 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 not going away in my lifetime, and probably in some of yours. And so I'll I'll just close with uh, you know it's dependable it's be around for a while and I, I and I said I was going to do this I didn't have to pull out the gloves I think it was a, <laughs> I think it was a very civil discussion and I think at the end I kind of agreed that uh, you know to, the language can be used where they make sense to be used yeah. absolutely yeah. thank you uh, Wolfram. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, also, in my opinion, both languages will play an important role in future. For us, it doesn't. 
Yeah, we we educate uh, COBOL programmers, we educate Java programmers. So in our case, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't make a difference. We support both languages, and both are really important on the mainframe. Thank you, and Mark. Yeah, although I'm a, a huge fan of Java as a language, uh, I I have to say that uh, COBOL will definitely uh, hang around for a very long time. And uh, I can only hope that Java will also uh, hang around for such a long time. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm very confident that it will. Thank you. And Herbert? Yeah, so I, I would say, I mean, as, as, we've, as we've highlighted, I mean, both are important languages. I mean, you know, COBOL is just too big to ignore. Um, in many ways, Java is too convenient to ignore. Uh, so so they, they, they both have a future on the platform. The thing I would have said that I didn't quite get the chance to, to, to stick in there is what about the new languages? Uh, people, if you're listening, look up Scala, look up Clojure. They run on the Java virtual machine as well. Look up things like um, Elixir, uh, look up Erlang. Uh, there are more languages available for the mainframe now than there ever were. And they have some really interesting potential in terms of what they offer to a software engineer. So I, I hope that some of this modernization will be about, you know, kind of thinking about what we have and thinking about what we could have in the future too. Thank you. That were really nice closing words. And, and I'm glad that we all agree, like this was started maybe as a match, but uh, yeah, each language <laughs> has is important uh there is no better or worse in general so i'm um, i'm glad we came to that conclusion <laughs> thank you guys uh, thank you Noel, for hosting with me uh you want to say something as well yeah thank you guys for the amazing discussion i really did learn a lot and it was just really fascinating listening to each of you saying such deep and thorough um answers to each of these questions and um yeah i <laughs> enjoyed being here and thank you Sabine for this opportunity also many thanks, thanks from our side for Sabine and Nor for you both uh, that organized this event it was really a fun to be there yeah thank well you. organized thank thanks you. so much guys great job thank you thank you and there are questions for the recording uh, I'm gonna make it available um, to the ones who registered in Eventbrite I will send out the link as soon as we have it up on YouTube um, for the others on uh, LinkedIn, please, um, I will put the link there as well and um, just uh, check on the IBM Global Student Hub. And thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for the questions and the comments. We really enjoyed it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.